All right, friends, it's time to give you loyal listeners a discount on protein powder. You may or may not know, but I launched my very first protein powder two years ago. It's a grass-fed beef isolate with only three ingredients, grass-fed beef, either organic cacao or organic vanilla, and organic monk fruit. Now, if you don't want any of the added flavor and sweeteners, you can also just get unflavored. And no matter what flavor you choose, you're getting over 23 grams of protein per scoop, which is gonna keep you full and satisfied between meals. I love starting my day with a Fab Four smoothie and breaking my fast with that much protein. It makes a serious difference in my cravings and blood sugar balance the rest of the day, and I've seen it with my clients as well. Now, I never thought I'd own a product company, but when I got pregnant with Sebastian, I realized the majority of protein powders were chemically extracted or enzymatically extracted, and I wanted to use heat and water only. I wanted minimal ingredients because we don't need those emulsifiers, fillers, or added vitamins, minerals, and probiotics. All of those additions increase the chances that it's not gonna work for your body, whether it be bloating, digestion issues. I just wanted pure clean protein to keep you full and satisfied so you could build the most delicious Fab Four smoothie. And I have to say, I'm pretty proud of the flavor. If you take a look at our reviews on Amazon, you'll see five-star reviews for flavor. And that is key because if you don't love your Fab Four smoothie and you don't love drinking your protein powder, you're not gonna do it. It won't become a habit and it's consistency that outpaces everything. So. If you're here and you're listening and you want to give our protein powder a try, use the code PODCAST5 for $5 off your order. And let me know if you love it. My favorite ways to apply this protein powder is in my Fab Four smoothie, making freezer fudge, making chocolate milk, making hot chocolate, and throwing the unflavored into all my kids' baked goods. So let me know how you use it. Let me know if you love it. And share this podcast deal with your friends. Dr. Ellen Vora is a holistic psychiatrist, acupuncturist, and yoga teacher. She takes a functional medicine approach to mental health, considering the whole person and addressing imbalance at the root. Dr. Vora received her BA from Yale University and her MD from Columbia University. She's a board certified in psychiatric and integrative holistic medicine. Her newly released book, The Anatomy of Anxiety, explores how anxiety manifests in the body and mind and how we can overcome it. Let's welcome Dr. Ellen Bora to the show. Dr. Ellen, welcome to the show. I'm so excited to have you. Today, we're gonna go deep into your specialty, which is the anatomy of anxiety. I think that so many of us coming out of COVID have dealt with anxiety and with every life change, whether you're having children or starting a new job, I mean, we can have waves of, of this feeling and it's unsettling. So I'm so excited to have you here. I've been following along online and it's just, it's a pleasure. Thank you for donating an hour of your time to me. <laughs> Kelly, thanks so much for having me here. This is so awesome. So can we start with your story first? Because you have all this fancy schmancy Ivy League schooling and you've made your way um, into the holistic psychiatry. Can you talk about your journey? Yeah. So I think my journey is sort of the holistic cliche, but you know, I, the fancy schmancy pedigree is really just what it means to be like a nerdy person of privilege, right? Like I was very perfectionistic and, um, driven. And so just worked really hard, probably not really internally or intrinsically motivated, just like the external validation of good grades drove me for many years but I loved biology. I loved English classes in high school. Like I had passion for what I was learning. And then I made my way to Yale as an undergraduate and um, promptly went on birth control and basically became depressed for four years, but that's a separate conversation. <laughs> and um, did not know exactly what I wanted to do with my life, but I kept med school as a kind of backup plan B and just kept jumping through the hoops and kept going forward. And throughout my medical training, I felt a bit like I'm in the wrong place. I would have a recurring dream of being stuck on a train that was racing in the wrong direction from where I needed to be going. And that's how it felt at the time. Looking back, I'd love to give myself credit that maybe I had some intuition that I was right where I needed to be, but I don't think I actually was operating from a place of intuition. But now at this point, I am really glad that I went through it um, I do feel like now I practice, I, I am, my my role in life, it is the contribution I'm here to make. And so I'm really grateful that I ended up going through with it all. Oh yeah, you you have what 
um, the recipe for the vortex is what I like to say. It's when you're, when you're, what you're passionate at and what you're good at align together and you can execute it all at the same time. It's like the momentum is, is sucking you down that tunnel versus, you know, versus having to push something up a hill. It's very obvious from following along that you really are truly passionate about what you're doing, which we, we need people like you. And to be of service. And I think for me, like a really big switch that happened was when I recognized um, like to, to feel any relationship to spirituality and to basically feel guided in that way, to feel like there's a kind of ecstatic, joyous, light-filled feeling of like, head this way, do more of that. And I didn't have any access to that for so long. And then once I actually became established and and just kept getting weirder and weirder, basically, once I gave myself permission to practice as a weird, witchy psychiatrist and just play <laughs> myself, now it keeps feeling around every turn. I have a strong intuitive sense of go this way, not that way. But none of that answered your question of how I did the weird switch from like, shiny land to holistic land but like so many people in this space it's because my own health was completely out of balance and a lot of that went down while i was in med school and i was simultaneously learning how to treat people and seeing right before my eyes the limitations of that um how i would you know i was taught to be so um crafty with the prescription pad and i saw my patients get more and more and more medicated but rarely thriving and then at the same time in parallel, my body was just like this, you know, the springs popping out in every direction. And I was bloated. I was having migraines. I had acne. I had irregular periods. I eventually was diagnosed with PCOS. My joints hurt. I couldn't poop to save my life. Like all of that was going on. And I was healthy, quote unquote. I was doing everything right. And I was literally a doctor and I should be somebody who knew how to keep myself well, but I, I didn't and I couldn't. And so I realized when I would go see my primary care doc and she'd be like, well, maybe you just need to go on Prozac and birth control. Plus, <laughs> and that's plus Miralax. Plus Miralax. Yeah. <laughs> Miralax. Um, but I, I, without having the language at the time, I didn't have the functional medicine language around root cause resolution versus symptom suppression. But I had some vague understanding or a sense I was like, maybe none of this is actually fundamentally fixing the problem, birth control and Prozac. Maybe, maybe something's wrong here. Like I'm the successful product of, of 500 generations of people that were able to reproduce. Like, why don't I get my period? Seems funny that that would just go wrong suddenly this generation. And so it, it had me start exploring, um, are there different approaches to health and healing? Definitely. I mean, I feel like so many people that I bring on that have have so much passion behind what they're doing have gone through it personally. They know what it feels like to feel like they're not being listened to. They know what it feels like to have these symptoms that could be quote unquote written off as normal. And just like, oh, this is just what's happening to people now. We're dealing with a lot of infertility. We're dealing with PCOS. Like adult acne is normal and like a bunch, you know, normal pooping is, you know, <laughs> three times a day to three times a week. Like three times a week is not going to make anybody happy. <laughs> That's not <Yeah>. normal. <laughs> really normalize like people who should be young and healthy being really pretty severely out of balance. And we've right. come to see like, well, it's just the way things are. It's common. But just because it's common doesn't mean this is actually normal or healthy. Right. And happening usually, I find this message to be really hopeful. It's, we have a, a system right now that is, this is our genetics. We think like, okay, it's genetic, it's hereditary, that's why you're depressed, that's why you have hormonal issues. Um, and absolutely, genes play a role, it creates a predisposition. But what's hopeful, a little overwhelming, but hopeful is that we don't, our genes don't change in the course of two generations. Like the fact that we have chronic disease to such epidemic levels and autoimmune disease and infertility, this is environmental. And that's playing such a significant role in how we're getting so out of balance. And that is overwhelming. And there's complicated, nuanced conversations to be had around um, responsibility and systemic factors making this difficult and inaccessible. But I find that at best, it's a hopeful message because it means there's something we can do about this and we can change it. Right. I love having this platform as a way to educate people in the changes that they can make in their own life. And just to, I mean, we can't make change and we can't go on down the road to healing unless we have some education and some knowledge in the space. 
So let's talk about you on that knowledge quest to heal yourself and how and what were major changers in your health. Yeah. So, I mean, it was such an inefficient process for me. It, it was probably about a 10 year journey. So I won't give you the play by play. Yeah. <laughs> All the weird forays into like early 2000s Google and wellness that I went down. But part of what I'm here to do in my role as a physician is really just to make other people's processes more efficient to expedite their healing journey and be like, you don't have to do that foray that turns out to be a dead end. And you don't have to do this one that actually creates more problems than it solves. For me, really critical changes. Um, one was for me, gluten-free and my mom was celiac. And I suspected that gluten wasn't my gastrointestinal tract's best friend, but I went to a gastroenterologist and I was like, you know, can you test me for celiac? My mom has celiac. I'm always bloated, always constipated. And when I do poop, it's angry. And I was like, so maybe it would make sense that I'm celiac. And he tested me and I was negative. And he's like, soldier on, you can and should continue to eat gluten. Yeah. Like, okay. And so <laughs> I just took it upon myself to go gluten free. And of course, within days, um, a lot of things turned course. And so, you know, it began a, a gradual but really pronounced reversal in my gastrointestinal issues and skin issues and joint issues and mood issues. And that was a really interesting one for me that I've learned over and over again is that I feel sad and kind of pitted out when I'm inflamed from gluten. And when I'm gluten free, I don't. And I actually feel happy and joyful. And when I was in college, looking at the happy, joyful people, I resented them. And I was like, nah, they just don't see the truth about the world. Like that, those irritating, happy people, they just don't get it. But then I became one when I was gluten-free. I was like, oh shit, I have to like grapple with the fact that, you know, one can have a hopeful, positive, <laughs> optimistic outlook on life and, and still be aware of the problems of the world. Um, and, I, and I test that every time I, you know, wittingly or unwittingly, have a gluten experience and then I end up with that sad feeling again. Um, and yoga was a really big factor for me. And um, it really outclassed all of the interventions that um, conventional medicine had to offer for me to just go to a yoga class and experience that community and that exercise and mindfulness and to just breathe in that way for an hour and tip my nervous system into a parasympathetic tone with powerful medicine. And so those are some big ones. And then really, you know, and this one is harder to write a prescription for, it was community. I had to have better friends in my life. I had to have better relationships and that was an agent of healing. Well, I love that you're bringing this in because I think people will go down the rabbit hole of prescription after prescription. And like the doctor, that the gastro that you saw, if the test doesn't say that you're a celiac or that you have a problem, it is this is this is the this is exactly how it should be and you should soldier on eating gluten and but you made that connection between your mood and the food that you were eating and you made that connection on your yoga mat as well and with your friends um i think it's a really powerful message because i was thinking last night before our podcast actually about the times where i feel the most joyful i absolutely feel the most joyful when i'm moving my body I'm absolutely, I absolutely feel the most joyful when my family's sitting around a table, like at dinner time. Like it's, if we're having dinner and we're doing it at the bar in the kitchen and I'm halfway cooking and we're not sitting and I mean, my children are eating fast, they're, they're racing in their bodies. Like they don't sit and chew and Toshin will literally ask, he'll wave his hands like he's done. He's like, pick me up, I'm done. If we're, if we're moving quickly, in the kitchen and cooking slash eating and nothing's like it's not all prepared and we're sitting and so it's interesting that you bring up those two things as part of your healing because not only does that really deeply resonate with me but in just looking at 2022 and thinking about what are the most important things in my life and how can i get continue to be purposeful with decision making and what are negotiables and non-negotiables um sitting at the table is just like, it's a non-negotiable for me. My kids are, you know, they're one and three now, and it's just, this is like the way it needs to be. And for me, moving my body with yoga, it's the same as you. It's like, I am a better, I show up in a, in a totally different way. And I can make excuses that I'm a mom and like my kid's not sleeping. And 
I think you give yourself grace in that first year after you have a child, but to, to make your way back to your mat, to be able to show up in a different way and not to believe like maybe the vibe you were believing in college that you're just a negative person and um how could those happy people feel that happy it's you let that energy like rush through your body off on your mat mm, mm, yeah i really love that your child like kind of rebels against the rushed you know half present <laughs> meal times because kids are so like so dialed in psycho spiritually right and like that's a really authentic i'm done like is your stomach full or are you just done with this way of like connecting as a family and i'm done <laughs> yeah. right like if we really come back to the why and the purpose and in our lives i tend to think and you can go a lot of directions with this but i tend to think it comes back to community and relationships we're really here to have this human experience in connection with other people you know and like the most cliche sophomoric you know, way of summarizing that is like, it's really love is the only thing that matters and it's all love. And I think that the trouble is, is that what our lives look like these days, maybe at the beginning, it was all supposed to be, you work this job, so you have this salary, so you pay these bills, you have a shelter so that you can spend time with the people you love. But we kind of get really far away from it. We get distracted from it. And we need to remember like, when we're making decisions and trade-offs, like this was all in the name of leaning into love. And if our career ends up getting in the way of that, we maybe have gone astray. I think the wellness world has an interesting parallel with that, where it's like, it, to me, the, the, the why of wellness is so that you can lead a fulfilling life. And if your physical health is so out of balance that it's standing in the way of leading a fulfilling life, then we have to roll up our sleeves and get to work. We need to get things back into balance. But if the, the, the sort of tasks on a daily basis in the name of wellness are the things that are standing in the way of a fulfilling life, then we've gone too far. And like, if you're turning down dinner party invitations and you're making your life smaller and you're having less connection with other people in order to meal prep or eat in a particular way or control the situation, like that's when it's become counter therapeutic. And we always just need to keep coming back to that focus. Oh, it's like, I want you to say that again and louder because it's so many times I sit down with clients and they want to control every minute of every of their life. And I feel it's robotic, like it's unemotional. And we are emotional, intuitive, like energetic beings. And I, I do worry. I'm like, who is telling you from the outside world that you have to do X, Y, and Z to feel in a healthy healthy place like healthy for you could be eating whatever it is that you eat but like having a minute for yourself having a dinner with a friend like yes thank you for saying that because it is it is a to-do list that will never end if you are following every wellness influencer on the internet <laughs> yeah. and i want to sort of um, also represent why this pitfall is common and why I've certainly, you know, succumbed to it at points in my life. I don't know if you have, but it, you know, I want to give grace to anyone who's found themselves oh, really I have. on, on yeah. the treadmill and, and never ending wellness treadmill. It's sort of like, I think about it as we recognize that there's like this dynamic between taking things in and putting up a shield. And think about it in terms of love. Like if we allow ourselves to just be energetically porous everywhere we go, we're going to take on a lot of whack energy from other people. So sometimes you need a barrier. And I think that our world, our food system, our agriculture, our environment, it, it has a lot of, this word is so overused as to be triggering, but it's like it has a toxic quality to it. And so it's a very active process to have just the right amount of porousness and, and to sort of know how much to take in. But all this is to say, it's hard to eat well in our modern life. Mm -hmm. And um, and so it, it understandably gets us bogged down and we get confused about where should we strike the balance. And I certainly find, I've found we kind of live in a state of balance with that, but I work with patients all day, every day who are struggling to find that balance. And it's really not an easy one size fits all thing. Some people really have to make pretty proactive choices so that they can feed themselves well and still go about their lives and survive. And other people have more wiggle room, but I think that it, it's just difficult because our modern world is this assault on sensitive bodies. And if we lived on like 
paleo whole 30 island and <laughs> all the water and food was healthy and there was a you know volcanic soil like we'd be okay and you could have a lot of ease with this process but instead it does require swimming upstream sometimes to make sure we're feeding ourselves and staying well totally i mean i think about i mean you mentioned it a little earlier but like it's access and time and financial like ability like it's do you have a farm near you or a farmer's market or a good grocery store does your job and being if you're like me and you're like i am working and i have kids and i have a family and, you know like where is the time for going to the grocery store or even ordering groceries or making the food like how am i make, how am i setting my life up to have the time to do that and then it's like can i financially afford the xyz water filter air filter because the world's telling me that like my air and water is even bad for me you know so i think um yeah having an having all of that can make anyone feel anxious and feel like they need to control and they need to make these daily decisions which i want to i want to get to your specialty in anxiety i know we could probably rabbit hole <laughs> about just the world of wellness in general and how that's anxiety provoking um but but it is thankfully you're working with people and supporting them on this journey and sharing your tips you know with everyone who follows along but can we can we talk about anxiety do you have a personal history with anxiety so i i need a better elevator pitch around that it's complicated for me i look back at my experience in med school in college even and that was a that was a real admixture of depression and anxiety and even like a this is like i don't typically admit this but i think i even had kind of borderline personality traits like i was a real mess and um all i know is like i i was not self-regulating mm -hmm. and i didn't have a positive outlook and the life i was leading was overwhelming me around every corner and so that was my experience with it it was never like a, a discreet just anxiety alone but it was part of overall mix of nothing feels right in my life i definitely i mean i i can see how that it, it's confusing for people to self-diagnose or to just identify with one thing because when things aren't going well it feels like everything's not going well it's sort of like hey the clouds rolled in and it's raining there's thunder there's lightning there might be hail depending on the day and yeah i mean it's not you're not just gonna be like yeah there's a little rain cloud of anxiety it's like you're in you're in the storm and so that that makes a lot of a lot of sense to me especially with what you were just having to carry like going through going through med school and having um such high expectations for yourself um and having the, those drivers be your grades and an amazing like we said pretty pretty uh phenomenal educational background you know that's something that a lot of people aspire to um but it's a lot to carry as a single human being on your own if you felt like you didn't have community and you didn't have the tools to to manage those feelings I think you touch upon something that's so important also, which is the idea of like, how do we self-diagnose and should we be doing that? And uh, I, I get this feedback a lot is we're in this moment right now. If you just like drop the litmus paper into the stew of modern life, the pH is anxiety. Like that's, that's the vibe right now. Yeah. And anxious. And there's a lot of like, quote unquote, self-diagnosis of anxiety and sometimes people will say to me like we shouldn't be doing that right like we like we're over diagnosing it or we're lumping into a serious mm, clinical diagnosis states of just like life is hard and i actually really push back on all of that and i think that um the, the purpose behind like gatekeeping a diagnosis is really it has to do with well what are the implications for how we manage this for how we treat it and if we're talking about whether or not someone should start a medication, which can have long-term sequelae or consequences and can be difficult to get off of, like we should gatekeep that. That should be a really thoughtfully approached decision. But in terms of like, should somebody get a little bit of help and feel better? I don't see the need to gatekeep that all that much. So if yeah. someone's having a subjective experience of anxiety, like let, that's meaningful. That That's enough to say, well, let's begin our work. And then I also think that the idea of get help is a really fraught issue. Our mental health world is 
expensive and inaccessible and sometimes not even in your county or um, you know if there is somebody around who's good they have a wait list forever it's a really difficult proposition and I have this somewhat controversial view which is also like to, to get help can sometimes just mean you walk in you cry 15 minutes later you walk out with a prescription and did we really help somebody in that situation is that is that actually like a perfect what container for holding somebody and actually helping them reach a different state of mental well-being. So I think that I like the idea that when we understand that mental health is not just a neck up genetic chemical imbalance that needs to be treated with a pill or with psychotherapy, I think it can also be understood, I think it truly is, determined by all these other factors, our relationships, community, nature, our health, our gut health, um, very much rooted in the physical body, how we're eating, our level of vitamin D, our access to sunshine and clean water, um, inflammation, all of these factors also determine our mental health. And if we can start there with interventions that are accessible to all of us, that are often completely free and safe, you can take whatever you've self-diagnosed, you know, mild anxiety, severe anxiety, panic attacks, you can make some real impact and feel better and none of that needed to be gatekeeped. Yes, that's why you're here. Interventions that are free, people can make some serious headway in the way that they're feeling. Um, can we talk about each one of these little categories that you just touched on? Relationships and community, gut health, vitamin D, inflammation, nature, movement. Like, let's start, let's start with if I was a client coming to see you, I was a patient and I felt like, wow, like I'm in this season, you know, this is a lot for me right now to manage. Um, and I definitely, I think, you know, we said, I said this before the call, I generally don't think that I deal with much anxiety, um, but there are def definite seasons in my life where it is a storm and I'm like, okay, I'm not sleeping. You know, I have a two kids now. I have the, more, I'm paying for the mortgage all by myself. I have the business. I'm writing book three. I have the second product. I'm managing like a mini team, but I'm doing a lot, like managing all my social media, all my newsletters. And I am a ping pong ball and not my best self. So, so if I'm, if, if I'm ever to be in a season now is the season for me. So, so I walk in your office and I'm like, please, Dr. Ellen, I need your help. Where do we start? Mm, oh, and I'm just like bowing to you. <laughs> so, no. I mean, if you, if you walked into my office, I would basically try to communicate with my body language and the surround sound tissue boxes like, hi, like, tell me your story. And then I would ideally not talk again for like an hour and 45 minutes. <laughs> you would process and feel witnessed and feel validated and get some things off your chest and make sense of some things. And I'm actually not really intervening all that much. And I really want to know about both. I want to know about your physical health journey throughout your life, you know, going back to your mom's life and your maternal grandmother and great mother's life. And then I want to know about your psycho-spiritual reality. And that's how the book, the book that's coming out in March, The Anatomy of Anxiety, it's really, I break down anxiety into these two categories, what I call false anxiety and true anxiety. And I'll just say, I'll just caveat, false anxiety is not to invalidate the very real experience of anxiety. It's really to kind of recognize this is avoidable anxiety. It's the low hanging fruit and it relates to the ways that our physical health creates a state of imbalance that communicates up to the brain and says, something's not right here, feel unwell until we fix it. And a lot of us are just existing in that state 24 seven. And so that's where we can just chip away at stuff pretty readily. Are you inflamed? Let's get you less inflamed. Is your gut out of balance? Let's heal your gut. Um, are you micronutrient deficient? Let's repeat some of the things you're missing. Are you just not getting sunshine? Which is such a common problem when we can talk about the sort of, there's nuance there. Um, are you not moving your body? Is the quality of your sleep not all that good? Which is my favorite thing to treat because sometimes it's just a matter of pushing sleep a little earlier, protecting circadian rhythm with blue blocking glasses. Maybe it's your relationship to social media. There's a lot of low hanging fruit and we chip away at that. And then what remains is what I call true anxiety. And that's not something we can avoid by limiting caffeine or keeping our blood sugar stable or going gluten-free. It's not even really something we can help all that well with medication. It's, it's purposeful. It's here as our inner compass. And really the task at hand, the directive is 
how do we slow down and listen? And then when we hear it, how do we honor that? Because that's really, it pertains to the contribution each of us is here to carry out. You have your unique perspective and your unique insights and your challenges and your experiences. And that true anxiety is bubbling up to be like, hey, there's a, a reality in your life, in the world around you. It's not okay. And we're asking you to do something about that. Do you accept this mission? And it doesn't have to be heavy duty. It can be minor. It can be, yeah, like my grandmother is lonely and somebody should be going around there on weekends and just spending time with her. Or it can be, you know, you're supposed to be an activist. You're supposed to start this nonprofit, whatever it is. But we just have to know it for ourselves. And I think that when we start to recognize some of our anxiety is this inner compass, it's the true north. Um, it doesn't feel so uncomfortable. It starts to transmute into a feeling of purpose and something that we can rally around and feel driven by. And so I think that, you know, and mainly I would just want to get you to cry a lot because I think that's such an important release and we don't do it enough. And even when we do start to cry, we try to hold it back. We apologize. <laughs> and like, we just, as a culture, if we just cried a lot more and made it bigger when we do cry, that would go a long way to healing a lot of what ails us. So much that you just said that I want to unpack. Um, let's start from the end and work our way backwards crying. Like if anyone has listened to my episode with Dr. Will Sue, he was a trauma release therapist that I went to, to work with after Sebastian's birth. I, I talked about it and talked about it and was like rationalizing all my feelings for six months with like a regular talk therapist. I spent 90 minutes with Will and was like, I'm 80% better. I'm 90% better. Like I, mama just needed to cry and scream and shake and be heard. And I just needed, I needed what I should have not tried to hold down in the, in the delivery room. Like yeah. um, I needed to be able to do that in a safe, like safe environment. Even the very idea that a mom in labor should be trying to hold anything down like that's a that's a moment of pure like have permission to let whatever needs to flow flow but we have all these you know social expectations on us of like well don't be too loud and don't sound like an animal in childbirth and <laughs> and, and look out and have regard for your partner and for the nursing staff and you know it's all fair we want to be good compassionate people at all time but labor is a, is a kind of a special liminal space that we enter where we need to completely surrender and allow everything to flow if we're talking about the same will sue um he he also is in relationship to psychedelic therapy that is the same man and so um it's uh for me personally and for many of my patients psychedelics have also played a role in allowing me to access a layer of crying and release and grief that i wasn't accessing in my regular life and i almost feel like i learned how to cry better with psychedelics, I certainly learned how to open a much larger portal to for grief than I was accessing in my regular life. And I think that's had a, a really interesting, um, it, it plays an important role in how I work with patients now too, is how to help them access new layers of releasing what we hold on. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 I'm glad that you bring this up. I think the idea that psychedelics are just drugs and they're going to make you a druggie or you're going to become addicted the amount of healing that we're seeing even for people with any form of strong ptsd and they're like you said it's the ability to access yourself without judging yourself it's like what am i holding on to that can be released through emotion um i think it's opening the eyes of people who had stigma around it. Like this can be really powerful for people. And um, I'm so glad that you even were open to talking about that because it is this underground swell of like, this is, this is where it's going because people are seeing real healing. They're not just medicating something that's not going away. They're getting to root the root cause because they're able to be free mm. to, to, to access those things. Mm. And this is almost like a, an end of the podcast kind of thought, but we'll just go there now. Is Will also has this amazing quote, I think somewhere on Instagram, that's basically about how psychedelics are not just 
agents of healing trauma, but they're also making spirituality palatable for the Western world. And I think that that is also at the heart of my approach to anxiety. And that's felt like a little bit of an uncomfortable journey for me since um, basically I grew up in like a very atheist culture. Like some people are sort of rebounding from growing up in a very controlling organized religion kind of culture. And they're sort of on their journey rebounding from that. I'm almost on a journey rebounding from atheism and, and to basically find my way to a feeling of spirituality that feels true for me and to do that without shame of like, um, like believing in God wasn't the thing in my yeah. upbringing. Yeah. And so I'm like very imbued with this and it gives me so much comfort and purpose and meaning and guidance in my life. And I found that psychedelic work has helped me access that and trust it. Oh, so powerful. That's really so powerful because what you started this conversation talking about is having a passion for something and being of service and to have the trust in yourself to go out there, to get out on a limb, to, to go against your traditional Yale and Columbia University education and say like, we can treat anxiety, the different parts of it, false and true anxiety. We can chip away at the stuff that's really starting to nag at you, but let's get to the core. Like you're getting to the apple core with people of aligning their purpose with their passion and being aware of their intuition to say, this feels right for me or it doesn't feel right for me. I, I've felt all, I have felt all those levels of, okay, I'm getting too much. I mean, you know, my social media is kind of driving me crazy or, but or I'm getting into bad habits that, that would increase my irritability or something like that. But all of it goes back down to that center core of the reason why these things are bothering me is because I'm not in alignment with what I think I need to be doing or saying right now with what is true to me because of something on the exterior, because I think the world is telling me I shouldn't do that, or I shouldn't believe that, or I shouldn't push back against that, or I shouldn't go out on a limb and say something that isn't popular with the world because I'm worried about what this community might think. And that when that's happening, that's when the false anxiety is at its highest or those things are causing irritability in my life. It's nothing to do with what's external. It's everything to do with if I am in alignment with what my true self feels. In a way, we're on this lifelong journey of getting back to that image of your son being like, I'm done. I'm done with this way of eating dinner. <laughs> like this doesn't feel centered. And we just need to trust ourselves the way children do. Children are so authentic, but they're just like, that's not for me. And they turn their bodies away from something. But we get conditioned through the course of our lives to say, okay, sure, to things that aren't for us. We give our false yes, which is a concept from nonviolent communication, Marshall Rosenberg's work, which I love. And that was so grounding for me, helped so many of my patients to recognize we need to identify our true yes and our true no. And if we're going through our lives, giving out our false yes, to be non-confrontational, to be people pleasing, to try to fix other people's problems, like it never ends well. We betray ourselves um, and we just need to get back to trusting our own internal instincts and intuition. And I find like the spirituality work, it's not for all of my patients. And I very much honor wherever anybody is on this because nobody has the answers. I sure as heck don't. Um, but my patients who I think are amenable to this are available for it. I have found that giving them permission to connect to some form of spirituality has been a very critical intervention on their path towards remedying their anxiety. And I joke a little bit that my book is like, come for the advice around caffeine and blood sugar and gluten so that you can be less anxious, but stay for the part where I kind of try to convince you to like have some system of belief, whatever feels true for you. And if it's, if it really doesn't feel comfortable to talk about woo woo or spirituality, it can be nature. You know, it can be like, you love going hiking and there's just something about that. It, we're really talking about the same thing. That something is is awe, and you know, lean into that. That is a spiritual state. You get people. You hook them with the gluten, and you get them for the juicy stuff. <laughs> I mean, the gluten is uh, sometimes a turnoff too. <laughs> like, yeah. I guess it's worth bringing up like some of the actionable items in case there are listeners who are like, yeah. I was step. I was waiting for that. Yeah, they're like, you went into the crying stuff and the psychedelics, <laughs> but I was here. 
for the relationships and community, the gut health, the vitamin D, the inflammation in the nature. So let's go back to those topics because, um, because yes, we want those free interventions that people who feel like they have anxiety or whether it's false or true can start to chip away. So yeah. where do we get going? Going out of order. Here we go. So back to the basics. I think that, um, I almost like I've, I've listened to enough of your podcast episodes to know your listenership are very informed. Like they know their, they know their glutens and their dairies and their industrial seed oils. So I'll, I'll sort of like spare them on some of those basics, but I'll bring forward like some more nuanced perspectives. That I think we're not talking about yet or enough. Um, I do think that there's, um, there's a, I think we got sunshine wrong and I think that we, as a culture, have identified that indeed the, the sun's rays can create mutation in our DNA and create skin cancer. And that's very real. It's very real. And people die from skin cancer. I don't deny that for a second. But I think that all of these things exist in a balance. There's, they all come with trade-offs. It's no accident that um, vitamin D, which is really more like a hormone than a vitamin, was not something our bodies were like, well, let's just count on eating enough fatty cold water fish to get our vitamin D. Our body was like, no, we actually need a ubiquitous, completely reliable source for this. And that's because this is so critical to our well-being. So we're like, we're able to manufacture it from the sun, the thing that we would never be without. But it didn't anticipate the fact that eventually we'd be playing video games and working from home and wearing sunblock and we wouldn't actually have sunshine on our skin anymore. So that's where we are today. And I think that it goes beyond vitamin D. Sunshine on our skin, um, vitamin D is one way we can measure the effects of that. But there are other um, the different ways that we impact our blood pressure and our mood and our, even our risk of cancer, it's all related to how our body responds to sunshine. So I think we all just need to find the right balance for ourselves. If you have more melanated skin, it is safer and, and often necessary to get a little bit more sunshine. If you have less melanated skin, it's the reverse. And I think that there's something we get particularly wrong, which is that when we wear so much sunblock that we never get any sun on our skin and we're very pale, I think that actually leaves us most vulnerable to a sunburn that one random time we're out in the sun and we forgot sunblock or didn't have a hat. And a sunburn is really where the danger lies in terms of cancer risk. So I find that it's healthier to have a little bit of low grade sun exposure year round so that we're not so vulnerable to a sunburn. And then we're getting all of those benefits of sunshine all the time. And for each of us, that balance of what's the low grade amount, it's different. But you want to think about where did your ancestors live? And if they lived on the equator and you're in Chicago, then you might need to really enhance your exposure to sunshine. And if you're, you know, descendant from Ireland and you're living in Brazil, like it's the opposite and you need to be more careful um, because melanin in, in our skin is really just our body's way of saying, here's how we get the right amount of sunshine without being at risk of vitamin D. And that system kind of worked on the proverbial savanna of evolution. And now we move around the world and we live in all these different ways. And so we're just getting a little out of balance with it. That's one thing. Inflammation is huge. And I think that like that's powerful to recognize that these conditions that we think are just, um, we're depressed or we're anxious because of our genes, because of our brain chemistry. Um, when you start to recognize that it can relate to a state of inflammation in the body and cytokines or inflammatory markers acting on the brain and telling the brain we are under threat and the brain being like, got it, we're under threat, feel anxious. And so the solution there is not necessarily Prozac or seven years of therapy. It can simply be not being inflamed. And then your brain no longer gets that signal and you no longer feel anxious. And not being inflamed takes some work. You know, it usually requires healing the gut. It does require reducing some of the inflammatory foods from our diets. Sometimes it requires adding in things that are actively anti-inflammatory like turmeric. I find that, you know, all of the gut healing agents like bone broth and collagen are really helpful there. And then, and of course, things like onion, garlic, um, antioxidants in our foods. This is how we can reduce our inflammatory burden and we can feel precipitously less anxious just from that intervention alone. And then we can go into unpopular conversations about caffeine and alcohol, but I can also spare you if we want to. <laughs> no, you brought it up. So we're going to go there. <laughs> um, not making any friends with this. As I take I a sip of my coffee, please hold. <laughs> I'll take a sip of my boring herbal tea. 
Okay. <laughs> so, um, uh, caffeine and alcohol. I'm not here to say either of these things are inherently bad or we all need to square them off. That's, that's not the vibe here. It's really just, we have to be conscious and wide awake about how our individual biochemistry interacts with these substances. And for some people, some people are, are rapid metabolizers of caffeine. They can have an espresso after dinner and fall asleep and sleep soundly and good for them. Must be nice. Not me. <laughs> we have to be honest with ourselves that we are slow metabolizers, that we're sensitive to caffeine. And if you are somebody who is anxious and drinks coffee and you know that you get jittery and the effects are long lasting and powerful in your body, we need to look at that. And we need to recognize like, that is an anxiogenic drug, caffeine, and it's causing a release of cortisol or stress hormone. It can put your body in a stress response, which can feel synonymous with anxiety. So if you want to be less anxious, it sometimes requires reducing caffeine. PSA, you don't do that overnight. You don't do it cold turkey. You do it gradually. You, you do it in a sort of exploratory way. What happens if you go from three cups of coffee to two and a half calf? What if you reduce it and some of them are a black tea or a green tea? What if you get down to a few sips of green tea a day? Often the need for caffeine, it's created by the caffeine ingestion itself. So we all feel like coffee is my one true friend in the world and how would I get through life without it? But I call it my favorite drug. Yeah, but we're, we're giving it credit for being the salvation to the withdrawal that it created. So we really just wake up in the morning in caffeine withdrawal and we're like, ah, and there's no better feeling than scratching the itch of withdrawal with the withdrawn substance itself. So we're just like, coffee feels amazing and we require it to not be in caffeine withdrawal. But if you can gradually reduce the overall milligramage of caffeine that we consume on a daily basis, there's just a little bit less of caffeine withdrawal driving how we feel. And then when you're less in a sort of, am I in withdrawal or intoxicated with caffeine and in that dynamic with it, if you're just drinking less overall, you might still feel awake and alert and be a balanced person able to take on the challenges of the day, but without all of that caffeine induced anxiety. And then alcohol is an even less comfortable conversation, but basically it, it does make us, um, there's this neurotransmitter we don't talk enough about, GABA. We talk a lot about serotonin. That's always in the airwaves. But GABA is also really critical to anxiety. And the things that really rush our brain with a state of GABA are alcohol and the benzodiazepines, not things like Xanax and Clonopin. And it feels good because we're like, okay, I have all this tension, all these worries. Um, everything feels like not okay. And then you rush your brain with GABA and you're like, oh, actually, it's all good. And you feel like this warm hug and it's going to be okay. That's GABA. It's our primary inhibitory neurotransmitter of the central nervous system. And that would be wonderful if that's where it ended. But um, our brain is not really interested in whether or not we're relaxed. It's interested in our survival. And so it wants to rebalance and get back to a state of homeostasis. So when it sees all that GABA, it responds with benzos it responds by pulling certain GABA receptors. So then once you're off the drug and you have normal levels of GABA in your brain, it's almost like your brain can't hear the GABA and we feel anxious. And so then you need the drug just to feel at your baseline again. And then with alcohol, the body actually responds by converting the GABA into glutamate, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter. And then we feel anxious and out of not in a state of ease and we wake up at three in the morning tossing and turning with a little bit of a headache that's the glutamate effect and so all of this is to say if that glass of wine over a beautiful homemade meal with people you love is the act of radical self-love in that moment go forth and feel good about it but just be aware that um half asleep decisions around default setting alcohol use on a day-to-day -day basis it's probably contributing to anxiety and is it worth it and I think we just want to be making self-loving conscious choices. Well, first of all, thank you for attacking those two very um, emotionally charged subjects. Um, I'm going to start with your caffeine. Um, at just, just touching on that, twice a year on average, like January and my birthday month, July actually, um, I go from black coffee and coffees to green tea, matcha or regular green tea. And it's amazing because the more that I do this, and it's been about it's been about two and a half years of it now, the more I'm called to be like, 
it's a, it's a crutch. You love it. Like I see the science that says caffeine is full of antioxidants and like it's decreasing dementia risk. And I can take all of these scientific studies and publications and defend my position on coffee and my love of coffee. And then when I take the time off, I can look at the research around polyphenols and teas and um, the anxiety stuff and go, no, 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 no. Green tea is the way that I should go. <laughs> and I think it is, it, it's amazing to take, to just do things for yourself like that, where you're taking a break and trying to get in touch with your intuition on like whether something's working for you or not. And balance is always like that pendulum of, I feel the need to go take a month of, and take a month off and take in the green tea only because I'm not as emotionally attached to green tea. I don't have this, there's not going to be a day where I drink six matchas, you know, <laughs> whereas if, if someone's like, Hey, I'm going to Bear Coast coffee and they make their homemade almond milk and it's delicious. Do you want me to bring you back a cappuccino, babe? I'm like, yes, I do. That's what I want right now. <laughs> you know, like there is not that, Ooh, I got to have it. And, and it probably is more of the withdrawals. Right. And, um, and just, I think, interesting for all of us to just evaluate our relationship with caffeine. And is it a crutch or is it, is it getting out of hand or do we need to pull back or do we need to take some time off? But I love that you mentioned not going cold turkey and dipping down. I think that's a, an easy transition and something that can kind of give you a minute to say, like, is it serving me? Is it not serving me? Um, such good stuff right there. And then the alcohol piece. I want to dive a little deeper into GABA because there are a number of sleep supporting supplements that include GABA and um, just, I think, understanding the mechanism of action or like what's happening in the body when you drink alcohol and you have this increase in GABA and then you have the glutamate response because so many people wake up at that two or three o'clock in the morning time and they're like, Ugh! oh my gosh. And then they wake up more anxious and then they overdo the caffeine and they feel even more anxious. So, so just even having that education, I think is going to inspire people to ask themselves, is this for a celebration? Is this around us, you know, a table with friends with a meal? Um, is this working for me? Is it not? I think there's so many people who are sober curious right now and that groundswell is coming up too. So so it's good to know like what's happening in the body. Um, but what happens with GABA when you supplement with GABA? Okay. So when you supplement with GABA, my understanding is that it's hard to make GABA truly bioavailable for us in a supplement form. And I feel like 50 supplement companies are listening right now and they're like, no, 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 we've done it. You know, ours is liposomal, ours is lipophilic, whatever. But I think that... Um, I don't know, but I have tried it certainly with many patients and it hasn't been the thing that has stuck for them. When we talk about supplements that help with anxiety, I am much more convinced of the benefits of something like magnesium glycinate or even L-theanine than um, taking GABA in supplement form. Though I'm all in favor of supporting healthier GABA levels naturally, but I think it happens with nutrition, with rest, with re-exploring dietary cholesterol and healthy fats, with yoga and meditation and breath work and cold showers and cold water plunging and chanting. All of this is like what I think is actually, and acupuncture is a wonderful way of promoting healthier GABA levels. So I tend to think it's in those practices and avoiding the things that put us on a GABA roller coaster like alcohol and benzos. Um, I think you brought up such an interesting thing where you, where you landed there with like, it just invites us to explore. And I think that with alcohol and caffeine, there's a both and thing going on where it's like, yeah, coffee has antioxidants and magnesium, so it's healthy. And that's true. And sometimes we're sensitive to it. And so sometimes we hide behind that data to be like, see, it is a healthy thing, period, end of sentence. And it's like, well, for some people it is. And for some of us, it isn't. I wouldn't be shocked if for you, it actually is a healthy thing. Um, for some of my patients, it is. For some, it isn't. And it's really just a matter of ignoring the headlines and all of that noise and listening for our own personal internal experience with it, which I think we, we just need to get back to in general. Like we are so into, um, you know, at this point, like all the biohacking and being like, how is your sleep? Where the ring and measure it. And I, I'm not against that. I have so many patients who benefit dramatically from their aura ring and they realize going to bed earlier helps them not drinking, helps them save screens, all of that. It's great. But it's further reinforcing this idea of 
we can't listen to our own bodies. We need an external instrument. We need an objective finding to tell us. And I'm in favor of dusting off the connection we have to our own internal state and basically saying, well, I went to sleep at this time without alcohol, without screens, and I woke up feeling like this, and there's my data. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I like the idea of just um, reminding people that we can trust our own experience. Yeah. And to take, I think also what you touch on is that people aren't even taking the time to do that. I mean, it's just like, well, I can just wear this ring and it'll tell me that if I go to bed between 8.45 and 9.30, I get, you know, twice as much deep sleep, more run sleep. I feel more rested. And I woke up, I looked at my app and I knew like, yeah, I felt that way. But like, if you just took a, took a minute to do it without the ring, you, you would feel it. I will say for me personally, and for some clients, um, I do, it's almost like you could wear the aura ring for like a week, know mm. what works and then be like, okay, I don't need it anymore. I'll implement it. Like give it to a, wipe the ring, give it to a friend, <laughs> you know, I have it as a tool. You need like rent the runway for aura ring. <laughs> yeah. Like, you need it for a week. Then you learn all of the information for your body and then you go forth. Yeah. And I, and then you're exactly right with sleep and, um, it's, probably pretty obvious to like feel the differences in how you feel when you have great sleep hygiene and you aren't drinking or you maybe aren't getting revved up before before bed um okay so i want to go back uh i want to go back to you touched on vitamin d and gut health inflammation we can we talk a little bit about um this piece on relationships and community and we started there a little bit but how do you inspire your clients to look at their relationships and see if they're creating anxiety and, and to spread their little tentacles out into the world and create community that can support them to feel their best? Mm, it's so important. And it is like the least prescriptive thing in everything I do. Like I can be like, get the phone out of the bedroom and use coconut oil to keep your blood sugar stable and go gluten-free and take collagen and bone broth. And it's like, there, there's these instructions. And it's like, if you follow these steps, this will likely help. And when it comes to community, it's, it's so much harder to say, here are the steps. But so here are some themes that I see coming up and how I support patients with it. Um, one theme I see is that we don't feel like we can prioritize community in our lives because we feel too busy. And that's where I say, take away the barriers. Like for me in my life, um, I have a busy practice and I wrote this book, I do speaking engagements, I have a daughter, I have a husband, and it's like every moment is kind of spoken for and it's pretty crowded. Yeah. And so the way we have community in our lives, which is like a cardinal value in my household, is um, we say everybody come over at eight o'clock because that's when our daughter will be down and uh, we're ordering takeout and like this is no frills it's like come on over i did not cook you an eight course meal I, we're not busting out the fine china that we don't actually even own um we're not cleaning the house there's no expectation of like here's what it means to host i don't have my hair and nails done i just am in sweatpants and the house is messy and we order takeout but we sit and we hang out and we connect and that's the way we do community and that has the that has been what makes it realistic and sustainable and so I really like to encourage people to change any stories we're telling ourselves about the fact that we don't have the bandwidth. Um, there are ways to make it possible. That's one piece. Um, I think boundaries are a really interesting topic. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of chatter about boundaries on social media right now. And I like that we're talking about it. But I think sometimes we have lost the spirit of it. And it gets very aggressive and kind of shaming. And it's like, this person in my life is toxic. So I'm setting this boundary. I want them to feel punished by it. And you know, I've cut them out of my life. They're toxic. <laughs> They're dead to me. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, the rare person is truly so wounded, so broken. They're never, it's never going to get better. And it is the healthy choice to cut them off. But more often than not, we need to actually expand our capacity for understanding and compassion to recognize why this person shows up in a way that's not helping our relationship thrive. And to use a boundary, not to end a relationship, but to actually preserve a relationship. Using a boundary to basically say, hey, you might not realize this, like give them the grace of that. You might not realize this, but by not using my proper pronoun, by you know saying this thing about my weight, by asking me when am I having kids, by whatever it is, by showing up in this relationship in this way, you're, it's hurting me, it's not, it doesn't feel comfortable for me. So 
could you do it this way so that this relationship can continue, can thrive? And I think it's really like setting someone up for success to show up to us in the way that helps meet our needs. It doesn't obligate anybody. They can accept or decline. You know, they can be like, no, I'm not going to change my ways. And you can be like, okay, that's what I needed to know. Thank you. Onward. <laughs> but I think that sometimes it gives people an opportunity to be like, whoa, I didn't realize I was doing that thing that was uncomfortable for you, that you resented. I want, you know, I want this relationship to work too. So let me work on changing this. Right. And I think that we really want to be using boundaries with the spirit of protecting relationships. Oh, such a good such a good point. And I can give you a personal example, example of this. Um, not, I have a relationship in what, when, where this person is always is asking for prayers. So they're like, they'll send stories that are about, you know, little kids that are dealing with cancer or a friend's friend's niece that fell out of a, you know, like a, a kid's playhouse. And I have this underlying fear as most moms do of like, what if something happened to my child? And to get those stories via like a group text asking for prayers that then I have like read because it's not, you know, Instagram's going to serve up what Instagram serves up. If you spend more than two seconds on like a childhood cancer story, like that is going to be your grid. That is going to be your feed. Do not do that. I'm telling you, it's not the way to go. It's very, it's the worst ever. <laughs> like it is the worst ever. But I had to say like, this is actually putting me in a place of negativity, of fear, of, and I know it, you're doing it in like, because you believe in the power of prayer. And I want you to know that like, I will, would always pray for anyone's cousin's brother who had a problem, but it actually is too much for me to handle in this time of my life. And that I love you. And if it's in our family or whatever, like I'm all, I'm all ears, but like, I can't, I can't carry that burden. And I've put up boundaries around specific, you know, whether it's the news or in social media and I've taken care of myself to have those boundaries in places that are more like the internet related, <laughs> but I, 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 now I need to have a little bit of boundary on this group text and I'm happy to remove myself from the group text. If this is where you're asking for prayers every time, but I just can't be, I can't be carrying it. I can't be carrying the world's problems. I like want to stick to like my family, my village, my people. I can't, I can't do it. This is such, such an amazing example. And you just made me realize something I had never thought about before, which is that Instagram algorithms are in certain ways, like the power of manifestation made technologically manifest. It's like where our eyes dwell, where we give our energy keeps coming back to us tenfold. And that's the algorithm, but it's true in our lives as well. And we are just living in such an unnatural state right now for anyone who is naturally compassionate, sensitive, um, attuned to other people's suffering that used to exist on a community level in real life, in person. And, you know, it would ebb and flow and it would be a somewhat manageable amount. And these days, if your eyes and your energy are dwelling on the suffering in the world, there is an infinite supply of that and each story more horrifying than the last. And we do need to make conscious choices around that. Or as um, I, I heard it said once, um, we need rested warriors. And we need to realize that for everyone listening, you're probably pretty conscious about what you put in your mouth, how you feed your body. But what we watch and read and hear, it's also getting in. It's impacting our nervous system and our overall well-being. It's not to say live under a rock and shut yourself off, but you want to make really wide awake decisions about what you let get in. And I think you're just at a beautiful relationship protecting act, but also a self-preservation act of like, I can't claim all this suffering as something that I give my energy to. We have to actually put a boundary there so that the suffering that is pertinent to our lives, we can really show up rested and able to help with. So true. So true. Well, that just, I mean, it obviously resonated with me because it's something I've had to do and it's not someone in my life where I'd be like, I just, I can't be your friend anymore. <laughs> like I want to, I'm more than that person's friend. Like I want to be there in the trenches, but I can't carry the burden. Like I yeah. just can't. Um, and I think we can be purposeful about that stuff. And you're, you know, you're giving people all of these purposeful action steps around um, relationship, getting out in the vitamin D, like 
fighting inflammation by pulling gluten and, and balancing their blood sugar and using things like bone broth and um, collagen. Um, you really are a resource, Dr. Allen. Thank you so, so much. Um, I want to end on nutrition because you mentioned blood sugar a couple of times, and I'd love for you to talk about the research and science behind how blood sugar is related to anxiety. Yeah, blood sugar is to me the absolute first place I start with anxiety. I almost think of anxiety as a blood sugar issue until proven otherwise. And when we talk about blood sugar, and I'm sure you've kind of covered this concept, but just in case, like it, conventional medicine treats it very much as a one zero. You're diabetic, or there's like a 0.5. You're like, you're diabetic, you're pre diabetic, or it's irrelevant to your life. And yeah. that's not true. Like, in there's in the irrelevant to your life range, there's a lot of us that are you know, subclinically dysglycemic, where we're running around on a blood sugar roller coaster. And if you get hangry, you know, this is relevant to your life. And um, I find that a lot of my patients who struggle with panic disorder, who feel anxious, if you start to look at the patterns, what you see is that they're feeling their most anxious when they're in a blood sugar crash, which is typically happening either a few hours after skipping a meal or after a particularly sweet, and I think of like unopposed sweet meal. So it can be sugar or refined carbohydrates without anything grounding it, like healthy fats or protein, something that's slowing down the digestion and absorption and kind of meeting out the blood sugar. So something that's just a quick spike up and a quick crash down can leave you your body in a stress response. The reason why that happens, it's just the checks and balances of the design of the body. That if we are without blood sugar, our body says, okay, that can't go on. Our organs will fail. We need blood sugar. The brain, most of all, it's our most metabolically expensive organ. It needs a reliable fuel supply. So our body says, no problem. I store starch in the form of glycogen. Um, so let's pull the alarm and tell the liver to break down the starch and secrete that into the bloodstream. And we have glucose again and our organs don't fail and life can go on and it saves the day. And it's a good system overall. It also you know, it gets us, but the, the trouble with the system is that it is a five alarm fire in the body. It relies on hormones like adrenaline and cortisol to communicate all of this messaging. And that serves a purpose. It does motivate us to forage for food, um, which in modern life looks like going to the break room or the kitchen. <laughs> and like, I need cookies. <laughs> but um, the it's pantry all... flyby. Yeah. <laughs> but the trouble is that, you know, it also just leaves us, it feels synonymous with anxiety. Mm -hmm. And so then we are on this blood sugar roller coaster and every crash is a panic attack or a feeling of the world is overwhelming and my life is doomed. And if we just keep our blood sugar stable, we can avoid those unnecessary moments of panic and doom. And so there's like the definitive solution, which is eating a blood sugar stabilizing diet of real food and more healthy fats and more protein and getting your carbohydrates from starchy vegetables rather than refined carbohydrates and so on and so forth. Preach. And it, <laughs> we're on board. But then for the occasional person who's like, what? And they're like, but Frappuccino is my lunch and <laughs> is my dinner. Like if that's you and that feels overwhelming and just like something you can't even begin, so you write it off completely. There is a hack that I have found pretty helpful in my, in my practice, which is something like almond butter, or coconut oil, or even ghee, depending on what makes you feel like not grossed out, basically, um, having a spoonful of that at regular intervals. And this is more just like a bridge to having that definitive solution of a blood sugar stabilizing real food diet. But this can decrease a lot of suffering in the world. If you just have a spoonful of almond butter upon waking, maybe around 2 p.m., maybe before bed, it can really help stave off some of those blood sugar crashes because it almost gives you like a safety net of blood sugar. It blunts any crash. And so that is a nice hack to, you can start today. I love that major takeaway for everyone listening and, and really a good, a good tool, especially because you can, you name the periods of time where people probably have the, the most anxiety and you're thinking about, you know, when do people want to scavenge their pantry or like look for the food? It's that two o'clock hour. It's late night. Um, and a lot of times now with intermittent fasting, people are just like white having their caffeine and white knuckling it until one or two in the afternoon. And I always think that that's sort of, if, if you feel like it's hard to do that, it's going to backfire. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so much of this, it's like being in couples therapy with your own body 
And it's like, we have this relationship where like, well, the body can't communicate to me in words. So even though I kind of sense what it's saying, I'm going to ignore it. But the body is a persistent communicator. It will let itself be heard and it communicates in symptoms. And so basically if we're like, I'm going to white knuckle it and just live on fumes and caffeine until 2 PM and then be hangry and then snack on candy. And your body is like, what the hell? <laughs> you know, it's, it's useful to slow down and be like, okay, body, you actually have some things to say of value and to just slow down and listen and really honor what the body's saying. It's not your enemy. You know, it's really here um, trying to help. And so to just kind of get into more of a relationship of mutual respect and communication with what our bodies are trying to tell us. I love it. Today has been so informative, so many action steps. And I think ending on staying in tune with our body, listening to our body, you don't need the aura ring. You don't, I mean, if you get it, great. I love mine, but like it is, it really is true. It's, it's starting to get in touch with ourselves and understanding what is false anxiety? What is true anxiety? Are we in alignment with our body? And to know that we have to listen. So thank you so much for being here, Dr. Ellen. Can you tell people where they can follow along, when they can expect your book? I'm going to put everything in the show notes, but if people are listening, I want them to head to Instagram and hit follow. Yeah, my book is The Anatomy of Anxiety, and it's already available for pre-order. It hits shelves March 15th, 2022. And I'm on Instagram primarily at Ellen Vora MD. Um, but I'm also like awkwardly making a foray into TikTok. So if you want to laugh at me, head on over there <laughs> yeah. and see a boomer like trying to make reels. And then um, you know, my website, ellenvora.com. But so there's a lot of different places where I try to put a lot of good content out there for free to just help spread the gospel of um you can feel better. And a lot of it is free and accessible and safe. And you can really make these changes on your own to make a lot of progress in terms of your overall mental health and well-being. So such good stuff. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vora. I appreciate your time today. I can't thank you enough. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you for listening to Be Well by Kelly. Please subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Learn more at bewellbykelly.com and follow me on Instagram at bewellbykelly. I would love if you picked up my books, Body Love and Body Love Every Day. They're sold on Amazon and at all major booksellers. 